They've been extinct for millions of years, yet their grip on our imagination is as strong as ever. Dinosaurs evolved into extravagant extremes. From the beautiful to the bizarre, fantastic fossil finds continue to amaze the experts. It doesn't look real. The skull is just like something out of a science fiction movie. They're an example of evolution gone wild. That neck that keeps on going and keeps on going. That's bizarre. You're about to meet some of the strangest creatures that ever walked the Earth. What were these bizarre beasts? And how on Earth did they get so... weird? It's hard work, under a searing sun. But the fossil finds emerging from some of the most inhospitable places on Earth have paleontologists in a lava of excitement. Dozens of new dinosaurs are being discovered each year. From the American West, to Argentina, Antarctica, Africa, and especially China, Fantastic finds are amazing, the experts, and have scientists scratching their heads. Some of the dinosaur remains are loaded with outlandish appendages, revolutionizing what we thought we knew about them. But the dinosaur story doesn't begin with huge, bizarre beasts. 150 million years before the dinosaurs' catastrophic extinction, relatively modest creatures like these ruled the roost. Coelophysis had a rather banal body shape, looking much like a big lizard. It walked on its hind legs, ate meat, hunted in packs, an otherwise ordinary entry into the dinosaur order. Paleontologists think all dinosaurs descended from relatively ordinary animals like Coelophysis. If so, how did they evolve into extraordinary leviathans like these? What strange evolutionary mutations could have created such creatures? Like one of the largest predators to stalk the planet, Spinosaurus. A monster even more massive than the infamous T-Rex. Spinosaurus was resurrected by movie makers tens of millions of years after it vanished from the face of the Earth. decided that the T-Rex had had enough press and we were going to get rid of him. And so I had Steven put Spinosaurus in Jurassic Park 3. Spinosaurus is, as far as we know, the largest meat-eating dinosaur. The animal was somewhere around 60 feet long, which makes it a lot bigger than the T-Rex, which is around 40 feet long. So that's, that's a pretty cool dinosaur. It may be cool for cinema goers, enthralled by its computer-generated savagery. But the real remains of this carnivore that towered over T-Rex have created a conundrum for fossil experts. It had a crocodile-like head, but its back was stacked with spines as tall as a man. These vertebrae extensions have sparked a lively debate. Some think they anchored a massive muscular hump that would have made the enormous dinosaur all the more powerful. Others suggest they supported a skin-covered sail that could help regulate the animal's temperature by radiating heat to cool down or catching the sunlight to warm up. One thing is clear, the spines must have been doing something important, otherwise they would have quite literally been a drag. I think it would have made the animal more clumsy, I mean, quite frankly. It would have made it less agile. It would have made it heavier. It would have made it catch wind in a strong breeze. There's no good advantage to it that you can think of except showing that, hey, I can grow this five-foot sail, and I'm healthy, and I'm bigger than you. And here I am over here, and there I am over there. This is my territory. You're my mate. While most agree that the sail was used in mating displays, there's another question about where Spinosaurus lived. Some think it was aquatic, spending most of its time in or around water. The theory is based on its resemblance to a fearsome modern-day reptile, 
the crocodile. Its snout is constructed for eating fish, and so it's quite likely that these animals actually were aquatic. And so the only things that were really sticking out that were visual were sticking out of the water were these big fins on their backs. And so, you know, much of their display may have actually been while they were in the water. But this theory raises even more questions. Why did Spinosaurus need to be so big, bigger than T-Rex, to merely hunt fish? What was the purpose of its awesome jaws, powerful enough to shred another dinosaur? Or its forearms, tipped with long curved claws? Why did it evolve such fearsome weaponry, only to be handicapped with a cumbersome tail? It's an evolutionary puzzle that's perplexing paleontologists. We have never really seen anything quite like it in the dinosaur world or, or thereafter. I mean, they're an example of evolution gone wild. Even the terrifyingly familiar T-Rex has apparently inconsistent features, and many dinobiologists are baffled. With an oversized head and 23-centimeter serrated teeth, T-Rex delivered one of the most devastating bites ever seen in the animal kingdom. What then was the purpose of its puny arms? He might have been able to scratch his belly after he ate. That's about it. Couldn't reach his mouth, couldn't, couldn't clap, and yeah, couldn't do much of anything. One logical explanation goes back to evolution theory. When one part of the anatomy evolves to a high degree, other parts may become redundant and eventually disappear. In the case of the T-Rex, it's been argued that its large, agile and powerful head diminished the need for arms. Why does T-Rex have small arms? Because he didn't need them. And was probably losing them. What appears to have happened in, in the Tyrannosaur lineage leading up to T-Rex is that the bodies of these animals just uh, kept going, but the arms got left behind. They're, they're also losing fingers. They've gone down to two functional fingers. At first, this explanation seems compelling. Supporting evidence can be found beyond T-Rex. In the remains of another fearsome-looking carnivore that rampaged across what is now South America, around the same time as T-Rex stalked North America. Carnotaurus, or meat-eating bull, named after its peculiar horns, was not pretty. It had a strangely shaped head, tiny teeth, and small arms. These small arms would have a surprise in store for scientists trying to put together the pieces of a perplexing evolutionary puzzle. The ancient bones of the bull-like Carnotaurus revealed an anatomical anomaly that didn't add up. Carnotaurus is one weird-looking dinosaur. It's got a very foreshortened skull. It looks like someone's gone up to this dinosaur and smashed it in the face with a frying pan. But one thing that really strikes out, though, is this enormous shoulder blade. It is absolutely vast. At the end of the shoulder blade, you'd expect to see enormous arms. But you don't. They're absolutely tiny. In fact, it makes the arms of Tyrannosaurus rex look large. The logical convenient explanation says that both Carnotaurus and T-Rex were evolving, gradually losing their arms, having developed strong, agile heads to replace them. But now two new discoveries are presenting serious problems for this theory. It turns out those relatively puny-looking arms weren't so useless after all. Biomechanical studies have shown that T-Rex could have lifted around 180 kilograms with those puny-looking arms, more than the average weight of two grown men. And another startling find presents an even more serious challenge to the heads replacing arms theory. A miniature ancient ancestor of the mighty T-Rex. It appears that this relatively tiny creature, about three meters long, was already evolving a bigger and better head at the expense of its arms, some 60 million years before Tyrannosaurus rex. We have found the Ur Tyrannosaur, the roots of the Tyrannosaur radiation, an animal that has all the features that we think are truly characteristic of Tyrannosaurus, the two-fingered hand, the enlarged brain, the enlarged jaw muscles, the long and lanky legs for running, the tiny arms, we're going to call it Raptor Rex. 
The find is so recent that only the head and neck of the Raptor X's have been modelled. Making a slightly less fearsome, yet still ferocious profile. But it's the tiny arms that have sparked a sensation. In dinosaur evolution, these were supposed to have been a much later development. Why were the arms still there? Perhaps Henry Fairfield Osborne, who named T-Rex back in 1905, had it right all along. That those arms were not engineered for maiming, but mating. He saw the big snack like teeth and he said this is for killing dinosaurs and the long feet and he said this is for catching dinosaurs and he saw the tiny arms and he said that part is for loving. That's the tickle part of T-Rex. Osborne's idea makes sense. Better to placate rather than pester a potential mate, especially one with jaws jammed full of razor-sharp teeth. 150 million years before the age of the dinosaurs was brought to a sudden and cataclysmic end, the Earth was quite literally moving beneath their feet. What started as a single continent called Pangaea began to break apart. As the Earth's surface changed dramatically, so did the dinosaurs. The so-called Dawn of the Dinosaurs, the Triassic, was about to give way to their middle period, the Jurassic. And evolution was about to give birth to the bizarre. As newly formed continents shifted, climates changed. Pockets of lush yet isolated environments spawned a range of very different animals. Dinosaurs grew to mind-boggling sizes. An ancient evolutionary arms race, predators' weapons pitched against prey's defenses was escalating, and a new kind of eating machine took an early lead. The time of giants had arrived. They were the sauropods. One of the most extreme necks to evolve among the sauropods was that of the 20-meter, 15-ton Mamenchosaurus. Its neck alone is longer than the rest of its body, basically. When you look at the animal, it looks, it looks disproportionate. It looks like it's going to fall over because the neck is so long. But evolving a ludicrously long neck from a smaller body gave animals like Mementosaurus a huge advantage. They didn't have to expend a lot of energy to graze. A simple stretch of their elongated necks was enough to access the taller, more tender parts of plants. But how did sauropods evolve to such enormous predator-proof proportions? The clues are still preserved in the fossilized bones of these long-extinct, long-necked herbivores. One of the ways that we can study dinosaur growth is by looking at thin sections of dinosaur bones so that light shines through those bones and we can study them under a microscope and look for these specific markers. Um, things like growth rings. Same kinds of things that are occurring in trees today. The rings reveal an astonishing rate of growth. They grow between 2 and 56 times faster than all living reptiles. Such accelerated growth could only come with accelerated eating. The amount of food they needed is almost inconceivable. Some of the later sauropods multiplied the eating efficiency of their sweeping necks, with mouths made to munch through the incredible amounts of food needed to sustain rocketing growth rates. In the deserts of Niger in Africa, the remains of one such creature astounded fossil experts. It's this outlandish head that had them perplexed. The head belonging to the so-called lawnmower, Nisiosaurus. I picked up the jaw of Nisiosaurus and couldn't figure out how to attach it to the skull. It was so strange that it really took me quite a while to figure out that this dinosaur had a face like no other. Only its mother really, truly could love a dinosaur with a face like this. It may have been ugly, but Nishasaurus evolved a face for optimum eating. Shaped like the flat nozzle of a vacuum cleaner, its mouth could shave off and suck up huge amounts of food with rows of small, sharp teeth, all at the front of its shovel-shaped face. The sauropod's super-stretched necks may have been more than just an efficient mover for insatiable mouths. Long necks may have been essential for mating. Like the behavior observed among modern-day giraffes. A lot of people think that neck length in giraffes is being driven when there's only plant matter at the tips of the trees and the tallest giraffes are the only ones that ever survive. Wrong. Neck length is driven by 
mate selection. And there's a ritual where they wrap their necks around each other and push. You apply that back to sauropods and you'd have to say, well, they certainly have plenty enough neck to do that. Uh, I'd say probably that's what they were doing. But evolution wasn't just tinkering with the length and strength of sauropod necks. It also led to the growth of exotic attachments. Amargosaurus was equipped with an elegant double row of spikes on its back and seems to have had a pair of fins. One set of spines would be strange enough, but the double row is truly baffling. Paleontologists have been debating for years about what the function of those spikes might have been. They're in the wrong place to fight off predators. Perhaps they were used to make the animals look much bigger than they were, to intimidate any attackers. Or for courtship or mating displays. Odd structures like these are leading paleontologists to a new way of thinking. It seems that evolution had a strange way of transforming plain, straightforward dinosaur parts with obvious functions into garish appendages that have become the subject of rigorous debate. But as always with Mother Nature, there's method to the madness. Perhaps nowhere is the evolution of the straightforward to the fantastic more striking than when it comes to arming animals for attack or defense. Over the course of millions of years, it appears that intimidating weaponry sometimes evolved into something else altogether. Take the iconic Stegosaurus, for example. Surely these exotic creatures, with their giant plates and spiked tails, were built to stand and fight. One of the earliest known Stegosaurs was the Tujungasaurus. Uncovered in China, the Tujungasaurus apparently went overboard with its defensive array. A fearsome row of pointy plates jutted out from its back, leading down to a tail that would give any predator or competitor cause for concern. Four paired spikes, each 15 centimeters long, projected from what was probably a flexible whip-like tail. It also sported intimidating half-meter spikes, like bayonets, on its shoulders. But was this all really for protection from attack? Recent research on other stegosaurs has made some scientists rethink the defense argument. The stegosaurs' spikes are problematic. They're in the wrong place. It also seems that the plates were also far less robust than they appeared. It just so happens that a few days ago, I found a plate of a stegosaur. A huge plate. It was massive. And um, when we started brushing towards the end of the plate, I was staggered at how thin it was. Fragile is an understatement. The plates were also full of blood vessels, hardly the best defensive armor. Rather than deterring predators, the plates would have presented any attacker with a tempting morsel. You know, if an Allosaurus bit into one of them, basically, there'd be blood spurting everywhere. Kind of like a, a big old cookie, uh, just sort of, sort of blood-filled, uh, good morsel to eat. All of those blood vessels point to another possibility, that the plates were used to regulate body temperature. Arrayed to catch a breeze, they could cool the circulation. Pointed towards the sun, they would do the opposite. But many of the stegosaurs discovered to date apparently thrived with tiny plates or no plates at all. Leading some paleontologists to conclude that the stegosaurs' impressive-looking armory may have been more for show than practical defense. Many scientists suspect that the outlandish appendages, strange sails, and exotic head extensions of many iconic dinosaurs were there for show rather than any practical purpose. Used to make themselves look bigger, stronger, and fitter to predators, rivals, or potential mates. Perhaps it was all about display as display is all about reproduction and survival. Everything's for display. 
An animal does not have to defend itself every year, but it does have to mate every year. So display is the most important thing. Defense is secondary. The present is the best way to study the past. If you look at animals today, when you see, you know, really bizarre things like some of the, the you know, crests on birds or elaborate horns on herbivorous animals or, you know, frills on, on lizards and things like that, and you see, you know, 99 times out of 100 that there are display structures. The heads of different dinosaur species were crowned with all manner of appendages. So many were ominously horned. Spiked, collared, crested, or domed. Although they may appear to have been fearsome looking weapons, it seems they were designed to win over potential breeding partners. At the time of the Cretaceous period, the fight to reproduce had led to the evolution of some of the most flamboyant and creative sexual displays and behaviors in nature. It seems that often the key to success was using the head. And in the dinosaur world, the Ceratopsians bore some of the most fearsome looking heads, with spear-like horns emerging from broad shield-like crowns. They included the Triceratops. Classic films often depicted it fighting a T-Rex. These days, most experts don't consider this to be a terribly convincing idea. From a logical point of view, the last place in this world you want your defense mechanism is on your head. I mean, about the time you poke a hole in a T-Rex and he falls down, he's gonna land on top of your head. Perhaps a more plausible and obvious reason for the Triceratops headgear was to fight each other. Similar behavior is observed in many animals today. Males battling each other for dominance and mating rights. Such head-on violence is seen in mammals. And reptiles. Like the Jackson's chameleon which also bears a startling resemblance to its distant prehistoric cousin. Here's your Triceratops analogy. I mean, look at it, three horns. Unbelievable. Even has a, what they call a cask. This is very much like the frill on the, uh, on the back of a horned dinosaur such as uh, Triceratops. And there's some evidence of injuries on the frills of Triceratops that suggest that they did fight with one another. But chameleons would rather display their horns than fight with them. From humble origins in the Jurassic, the Ceratopsians' heads seemed to explode into exuberant spectacles as the age of the dinosaurs drew to a close. Including Triceratops and its even more outlandish cousins. The Styracosaurus, or spiked lizard, was crowned with a profusion of long horns extending from its neck frill. Chasmosaurus had an even taller, more elegant frill, edged with more rounded spikes. And then there's the equally curious head of the Centrosaurus. For many paleontologists today, these extremes are a clear indication that the Ceratopsians' elaborate heads were for display, not defense. Potential mates could recognize their own kind at a distance, size up their frills, and reproduce to ensure the survival of the species. To heighten the allure, the heads may have blazed with colors as extravagant as their size and shapes. But the distinctive craniums of one dinosaur family has paleontologists clashing heads. Cow, bug socks. At the heart of this rigorous debate are the pachycephalosaurs, or thick-headed lizards. <coughs> to some it seems, their heads were designed for headbutting. Some of their domes were more than 20 centimeters thick inspiring awe and controversy in equal measure. Of all the major dinosaur groups, the buttheads are the ones that inspire the deepest soul-searching among us, the 
most puzzled expressions, and the most extraordinary, exhilarating flights of idiocy. We're in a struggle to understand dome-headed dinosaurs. Adult pachycephalosaur domes are definitely not adapted for headbutting. Definitely not. Everyone agrees on one point. These creatures' heads must have been attractive to the opposite sex. But the argument rages over whether the attraction was purely visual or the result of headbutting between rival males. The skull domed head certainly bears a resemblance to the modern day musk ox. This is the butthead supreme alive today. The musk ox. Side view. Big googly eyes. Dome here. Please note it is domed. 67 million years ago, this rammed. Right now, in the Arctic tundra, this rams. But for other experts, the definitive evidence lies inside, not outside the skull. Jack Horner has been dissecting the fossilized heads of pachycephalosaurs for years. What he's found is inconsistent with the headbutting theory. They're constructed out of a very odd kind of bone. It is brittle, it's kind of like porcelain. And if those dinosaurs had crashed their heads together, they probably would have just shattered. The Pachys did not headbutt, and couldn't have, more than once. Once they crashed their heads together, it would have knocked them both out, and they'd have just been laying there. As far as Jack Horner is concerned, the domed heads of these dinosaurs were purely for display of health and vitality, not for violent mating rituals. But not everyone is convinced. Others point to contradictory studies showing that the skulls were reasonably sturdy and perhaps too well developed to waste on mere display. Six, seven, eight inches of solid bone in some of these large pachycephalosaur dinosaurs. That's a lot of bone to feed, a lot of bone to upkeep. Other animals also appear more than willing to risk injury to headbutt a rival away. If you're going to headbutt to impress a potential mate, you're going to run the risk of breaking your head. It does happen today with musk ox, and it's a risk you've got to take. Because that's the only way to get your genes into the next generation. Bob Bucker points to two other factors that support his argument. Like the musk ox, pachycephalosaurs have huge areas on the back of the neck where massive muscles could have been attached. And then there's the classic, underwhelming dinosaur brain. Though I love these animals, they were dumb as posts. Brain is very small. Small brains are harder to injure. The clash of minds over the headbutting theory culminates with one of the most bizarre dinosaurs of all. Enter the dragon. Dracorex Hogwartsia. What makes Dracorex Hogwartsia so wonderful? is it does look like something out of a fantasy movie. It really does look like a dragon. With this strange, spiky skull, it doesn't look real. It's a face engineered for headbutting, according to those who support the dinosaur headbutt theory. It also bears a remarkable resemblance to the head-banging African warthog. And when two casts of Dracorex's face were mashed together, something amazing happened. This is craniological velcro. There's so many bumps that you press their heads together and they don't slip. So push and shove and push and shove and push and shove until one of them gives up. But here also, opinions differ. Headbutt theory doubter Jack Horner suspects that Dracorex wasn't even its own species, but merely an adolescent pachycephalosaur. Clearly, the so-called Dragon King Hogwartsia is not going to put the headbutting controversy to rest. And now, an even more puzzling little dinosaur has charged into the debate. A dome-headed mini pachycephalosaur about the size of a cat. We have found an absolutely bizarre headbutter that we believe is a dwarf. A little animal we're gonna call mushroom head, mycocephaly, because it almost looks like it's wearing a top hat that's expanded, yet it's filled with solid bone, covered with an armored surface that also is smooth at the top, but could this new dinosaur simply be a baby pachycephalosaur? CT scans told a different story. The sutures between the bones in its skull had completely fused, which means the animal was a full-grown adult. I think 
This is our smallest head butter ever to have evolved. While the argument over headbutting rages on, evidence has been found of one creature that may have perfected that gentlest of seductions, the love song. The curiously crested head of Parasaurolophus kept paleontologists guessing for generations. Parasaurolophus is just truly weird. It's got this enormous expansion of skull bones, which projects into this banana-like lump coming out of the back of its skull. For a long time, it was assumed that this dinosaur was a water dweller and used its unusual headgear as a snorkel. But CT scans of the crest showed that there was no opening at the top to breathe through. Instead, the scans revealed a series of tubes, bearing a striking resemblance to a trombone. Using the CT scans to generate a 3D virtual instrument, scientists in New Mexico may have even recreated its eerie utterances. In fact, its crest might have had a dual purpose when it came to flirting, displaying both audibly and visually for the opposite sex. Though the arguments about exactly how dinosaurs use their heads continue unresolved, it's generally accepted that dinosaur reproduction was a roaring success by the late Cretaceous, regardless of exactly how they attracted each other. But their thriving populations were about to be wiped out by a single cataclysmic event. The survival of the dinosaurs rested upon another quirk of evolution that would result in some of the most curious creatures ever seen on Earth. Having dominated the Earth for more than 150 million years, the dinosaurs were doomed. An asteroid was on its way that would unleash global devastation. But evolution had provided a lifeline for a specific group of dinosaurs that would eventually evolve to conquer the skies. But... One of the early bird-like creatures was the Epidendrosaurus. Standing on two legs, with forearms and claws elongating into wing-like proportions, and possibly sporting feathers, sparrow-sized Epidendrosaurus couldn't fly. But it probably did live in trees, a habitat suited to its claw-like hands. These claws were completely out of proportion to its body, with one finger twice as long as the others. I mean, it's sort of similar to what you see in this type of lemur called an eye eye in Madagascar, where that really elongated finger may have been used to, you know, to dig into the bark of trees after termites or some other insects that they were eating. You know, that's also a very, very strange thing. More than a decade ago, Mark Norell discovered some of the first direct evidence of bird-like behavior among dinosaurs. <laughs> All right. Fossilized dinosaurs were uncovered sitting on their fossilized eggs. These were the oviraptors. Most oviraptors looked like birds in shape and size, the largest being smaller than an ostrich. That is, until a giant was discovered. Gigantoraptor, more than five meters tall and weighing in at one and a half tons. This was absolutely enormous. This was a big animal. It's almost on the scale of Tyrannosaurus rex. But think scaling a giant chicken. This is what this animal almost looked like. This enormous dinosaur had a toothless beak, suggesting that it ate plants. But its sheer size and fearsome claws are evidence that it may have been a meat eater as well. But perhaps the most mysterious bird like dinosaur of all was the Dinochirus. Known only from a single set of tremendous arms and claws, the animal may have been 12 meters long. Originally imagined to be a deadly carnivore, tearing its prey to shreds with those incredible claws, Dinochirus may actually have been a gentle giant. Some paleontologists think that it may have behaved more like that most placid of animals, the sloth. But 
but until more of its intriguing fossils are found, Dinochirus will remain largely a creature of the imagination. Dinochirus lived at the end of the Cretaceous period, and may well have survived to witness the cataclysmic end to the age of the dinosaurs. Its line did not survive. But some little dino birds did. And no one knows why. It's one of the greatest mysteries in the dinosaur's intriguing story. All we do know is that the basic body plan, the bird plan, somehow made it through to the modern age. Now birds are the bizarre dinosaurs of the modern world. Far more successful than mammals or reptiles, birds have thrived in virtually every habitat on Earth. And nothing can match them in terms of courtship behavior and spectacular mating displays. A reflection of their ancient cousins who stretched the bounds of nature's creativity. They evolved horns, frills, spikes, plates, long necks, long tails, sharp claws, big teeth. They do all of these things. And they're wildly successful organisms on the planet from 228 million years ago to 65 million years ago. They're the kings and queens of the Earth at that time. Tantalizingly, only a fraction of all the dinosaurs that ever existed have been discovered. Meaning that even more mind-boggling and mystifying creatures are out there, just waiting to be found. This amazing amount of material we find, some of it's going to be some very unusual animals. So it was probably a lot weirder in the past than we can even imagine. That's the fun part of paleontology because you can be assured of this, that we're going to find some new and bizarre dinosaurs in the future. There are plenty of surprises out there. So many things that you can't predict. All I can say is, you know, be ready for anything. Meet one of the most bizarre creatures ever discovered as we follow scientists' attempt to reassemble it in all its predatory glory in Bigger Than T-Rex, tonight at 10.